Hi guys, welcome to another episode of the Richard Schreiber Show. In today's show, I interview the very talented film and dance composer Aurelie Webb. This was such a lovely chat. Uh, The wonderful thing about this episode is that we talk a lot about uh, social media and, you know, your phones and... Aurelie had a really nice take uh, and experience from Instagram and how that kind of really helped her through a tough time, which is really refreshing for me to hear because I often uh, have a a negative view of a lot of social media and and sort of our habits around our phones. Uh, We also talk about how Aurelie got work through Instagram as well and, you know, and the work she does as a film and contemporary dance composer. Hope you enjoyed the episode, guys. Take care. O'Reilly, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right. Well, you're welcome. It's an absolute pleasure, absolute honor. So I like to start with a very simple question. Usually it's a touch of silliness. So uh, mm-hmm. tell me something surprising about yourself that not many people would know. Mm. You know, I really had to um, have to think about this because I sort of forget things about myself sometimes. <laughs> I have a terrible memory. Um, I am a trained theatre set constructor. Maybe, maybe that's a good one to go for. Um, sort of alongside the beginning of my music career and before I really started launching it, I, um, I built sets for, for theatres. So I'm pretty handy with the DIY um, and the old, the old painting stuff like that nice yeah what what was your favorite part of set was it was complete set construction or yeah yeah so building it completely from scratch um you know building the uh the the flat so basically it's just a a massive uh canvas um but yeah I think my favorite part was just kind of starting from nothing and seeing you know this huge kind of world uh be created which I guess is same with music, music composition. <laughs> I was going to so, say, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's uh, similar, not, not so much of a, a sidestep, really. <laughs> and you're also pretty handy putting up a shelf. Yes. I mean, probably I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't do it that often. I wouldn't, you know, want you to rely on me, but I'll, I'll, tr- I'll try it at least. <laughs> yeah, if you're the last one in the room, you'll put the yes. shelf up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, that sounds Definitely. just like me. That sounds just yeah. like me. Um, right, excellent. So you have a wonderful and varied career. Uh, and yeah, as I was saying before we started recording, you know, it's, it's, your music touches on sort of beautiful nuances of emotion that are very, very sit very comfortably in the school world. So mm-hmm. to date, what is your proudest moment of your career? Mm. Um, well, a couple of years ago, I had the chance to collaborate with a dance choreographer um, Cherry Moon, um, who was just really, really wonderful. I hadn't done uh, dance for a little while, and it was um, a nice uh, step outside the film schedule, I guess. Um, and we were really lucky, and the performance um, consonants was performed at Lowe's Jersey Theatre as part of a contemporary dance festival. Um, so Lowe's Jersey Theatre, it's in New Jersey. Um, you might have seen it in the Joker film. Um, but it's this kind of massive, uh, baroque, slightly decrepit, beautiful old uh, theatre. Um, sort of part of the ceiling is caving in and there are lots of um, sort of fountains everywhere inside. Um, but it, it was a special time sort of going into this amazing relic of the past that had been um, rejuvenated and then seeing our performance and hearing the music live as well, which I think is always really special. Yeah. So what was the, what, what was the setup for you? Was it entirely strings? Was it strings electronics? What was the, what were the instruments for you? It was all electronics, um, mainly because at at that time I was sort of exploring that kind of sound, but also we were touring the the dance quite a lot. Um, So it just made sense to to have um, a digital score. 
Um, so we had, uh, yeah, we, we had a, a backing track and then there were three dancers and it was a sort of three act suite as it were. Um, and lots of synths and kind of glitchy electronics in there on top of the, on top of the strings, which was a lot of fun. Nice. What was the, what were the pieces called? So it was consonants as the overarching thing. And then it was just movement one, two, and three. Um, I think mainly because it, it felt like just a, a journey. So it didn't really need, it didn't seem appropriate to have um, individual titles. It was just sort of different stages of the journey. We can hear that on Spotify, can't we? Yes, you can. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I was going to say, I've heard this. Yeah. I've heard this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah awesome. Uh, well, yeah, it's much like Philip Glass's dance piece. Dance piece one, but dance piece two. Yes, you know? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you don't need more more than that. You know, it's self-explanatory. <laughs> Fab. So, what what exactly was it? Was it was it just the fact that you had all of these elements, this beautiful setting, the live mm. dancing, the live well, the kind of half live, half backing track? Was it just was it that, or was it that you'd particularly wanted to be involved in dance and choreography? Yeah, I think it was a little bit of everything. Um, I hadn't done anything live for a little while. Um, and it was sort of, it was one of those things where a lot of things came together to form this kind of um, big thing. And um, I wrote the piece in about two weeks um, because basically the, the choreographer um, asked me to do it. I'd done a sort of demo for her, for, well, no, I scored something for her for another dance and she asked me to do this full piece. Um, but she told me the wrong date for when she would need the music by. Uh, and I already had a full schedule, but I thought, oh, this, but this seems very special. I've got to do it. Um, so instead of having about six weeks, I ended up having about a week and a half, two weeks. Um, so it's one of those things where it was kind of working through the night and going to rehearsals during the day. Um, but one of those times when I just thought, I'm so glad I said yes, um, because look what it's turned into. So I think that that's why it was so special. And one of the things that I look back on and think, yeah, that, that was a really good thing that happened. Nice. Mm. And yeah, uh, I, I, I've done a few, uh, pieces of contemporary dance and there is something mm. extremely different. Yeah, it's, it's one thing hearing your music being played live. It's mm -hmm. another, another thing completely, seeing somebody creating something completely new yeah. from your music. I mean, what was, the, was the process collaborative or was it that you delivered the score and then she choreographed it or was it a case of you knew the choreography and you scored it to the choreography? It was a little bit of both, um, which was interesting. I hadn't done it this way before, but just because of time constraints, she had choreographed about four minutes of the dance and she knew that she wanted it to be uh, nine, 10 minutes long. So I scored the first half of it um, with rehearsal footage and kind of scored it as I would have a film. Um, and then I finished the rest of the score and she choreographed to um, the end of the music. So she had a very clear idea of the structure and the, the way she wanted the progression to happen. Um, but yeah, there was a lot of give and take, um, a lot of conversation about the sound world um, and how the dancing was going to um, develop along the way. Um, but it, it, was, it was interesting to have, you know, I, I was following her guidance at the beginning and then she was following me more towards the end. Um, but I think we got more out of it that way. Um, and I probably wouldn't get the chance to work that way again because um, it was just a bit unusual because of the time constraints. But still, it was um, valuable, I would say. Yeah. Well, mm. it's your proudest moment. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. How did you cope with the sudden shift in uh, schedule. And also the other thing is, I know what I'm like when there is a live element 
you know, mm. uh, quite a lot of panic and pressure and stress yes. gets put on your shoulders. <laughs> I mean, how did you deal with that extra stress? I've got to say, I'm not sure I would deal with it in the same way now, although I, I might do, but a lot of denial was involved. <laughs> um, it was, I was also due to have a recording session of a string orchestra at the same time. Um, and I was almost finished with the cue for that. And I was preparing, um, you know, the Pro Tool sessions, but it was very much a, um, I just had to, compartmentalize everything be really strict about it um work as I was eating and and it, it was just sort of I would I cut myself off from everything for a couple of weeks um it worked at the time for the specific project mm. I would never do it again I mean it's not sustainable no um but it, it was a needs must situation <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Mm. Uh, uh, this, the, the thing I find with working to deadline is you kind mm. of, you knuckle down almost oblivious to the stress it's creating you. And then yeah. once the deadline's passed, you know, normally I get ill. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like, oh, no, I'm Ill. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you deal with it afterwards. And I think that's, what's so difficult about being a freelancer, you know, and, being in an industry where it's just so fast paced um but you've just you've got to look after yourself because if you burn yourself out you're of no use to anybody you know yeah um, absolutely i think that's probably one of the biggest things i've learned you know yeah i know it's it, you need to instill those boundaries don't you but they're sometimes very mm. difficult to instill because you yeah. know especially yeah, as a freelancer we i think we all have this fear if we turn down work, mm. no more work will come. But you, you sure, have to understand yeah. that if you don't put those boundaries in, you're going to take on a ton of work, work yourself to the ground, and then, yeah. as you say, be nice, don't know you to anybody. So mm, Definitely. Yeah. yeah, and I think if you overcrowd your mind as well, you know, if you've got so many different genres that you're working on, I find that very counterintuitive because, you, you know, if you've got, um well trailers for example if you're doing you know a, i don't know a sci-fi and then a massive action and then a very gentle romantic theme or something like that i think it's just too much crossover um and then if you're not taking downtime and switching off then you know you're just digging yourself further into a hole i could not agree more uh, i think yeah. uh, <laughs> That seems to be something that's ever present on my mind at the moment. Uh, as mm. I, I have a lot of projects. Uh, I do mm. tend to take on an awful lot of projects. Uh, but at the moment, yeah. I'm very, very aware of not taking on too much. <laughs> but I usually yeah. only realize I've done that once I've taken too much on. <laughs> yeah, when it's too late. Completely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so this was a couple of years ago, wasn't it? This uh, choreography. Yes. Constance yeah, that was uh, 2019. Yeah. Oh, yeah, so a few the dark years ago ages. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I kind of, I still think of it as a couple of years ago because I think 2020 is just sort of a, did it happen? I'm not sure. It, it was a year, but. Yeah, and I, I, look, I look down at my children and go, what? How are you all two years older? I don't understand. Yeah, they're quite tall now. <laughs> yeah, I know, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right, so speaking of kids, oh, this might mm. not be when you were a child, but mm. tell us about your earliest creative memory. Yeah. Another hard one, because as I say, I do have a terrible memory. Um, <laughs> it was yesterday. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not quite sure how old I am now, but I, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I grew up in a pretty creative house. Um, my parents are both amateur musicians and that's, that's how they met. Actually, they met through their, um, through their band. Um, so there was always music around. Yeah, it's nice. And, um, I think my, my dad plays guitar and um, actually I, I often forget that this happened, but I wrote a piece of music when I guess I was 11 or something for a school geography project. And we had to make a little documentary um, and 
I wrote a theme tune for it and he played some guitar on it and just a kind of 20 second thing. But I, I think that was probably one of the first times I wrote music and, and definitely the first time I did, um, you know, TV music. I mean, obviously it wasn't anything, but it was, uh, yeah, the, fir- the first time I, um, I did something like that. So the first time you dipped your toes in musical expression was yes. jingle writing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It was great. <laughs> um, I think I had some kind of bongo drums going in the background and um, I can't even remember the, what the documentary was. I think it was a sort of five minute um, Amazon rainforest type thing, but obviously filmed in, um, uh, in Hertfordshire where I'm from and, you know, in the woods or something and pretending that it was the rainforest. Yeah. The, the uh, rainforest of Hertfordshire. <laughs> yes. Very wild. <laughs> yeah. Fab. Yeah. It's, it's interesting that it, that it is, well, it was jingle writing, you know, theme writing mm. a theme tune because uh, yeah. although it's often sort of looked down upon jingle writing, it's incredibly difficult to be so concise with your thoughts musically. Yeah, uh, definitely. You know, that was my, understanding of or my experience of it was it's kind of like writing a good pop song you can mm. you can slate pop songs all you want but they're very hard to write yeah you definitely have to be so concise you know there's no like meandering 10 minute intervals you know yeah. there's, uh, there's no sort of slow movement well there is mm. and it's two seconds in the intro <laughs> yeah that's it <laughs> so yeah okay. no, completely agreed <laughs> So, I mean, that's pretty exciting that your parents were both, were they both in a band together or were they uh, in different bands, rival bands? So the story goes that they, they were in different bands and basically my, uh, my mum was a singer. She needed a new guitarist and a um, friend said, I'll call this guy up. And I think he was going to join a new guitarist and then basically they started dating and They've never said this part of the story, but the way I think it probably happened is they started dating, the band broke up, and then everyone resented my parents for breaking up the band. Um, but I don't think they ever got around to, to playing together. I think that was just it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. Well, yeah. Well, in a way, you know, I think that's nice. Yeah. Uh, I think there's, yeah. there's always so many egos in bands that everyone's going to blame I some, know. you know. Definitely. You broke up the band. I mean, how many people have said that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, and it would always have broken up. You know, they never wanted to make it professionally anyway. So I, I think it was probably in the running that it would happen. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, eleven-year-old uh, Aureli. Yes. Wrote a, wrote a jingle. Mm-hmm. How? Did, where did you go from there? Musically and creatively, I mean. You yeah. Know, well, I went to school and then, you know. Yes. <laughs> went back to school and I did the geography homework. <laughs> um, yeah, it's interesting because actually after that point, I didn't really think about uh, film music again for a while. Um, I wrote songs mostly while I was a teenager and I would write songs for friends as um, birthday gifts. Uh, which in re- retrospect is probably a little bit cheap of me because I don't think I got them. <laughs> I don't think I got them anything else. That's a great um, idea. I'm going to do yeah. that. Yeah, <laughs> it's a good one, isn't it? You know, yeah. a professional piece of music instead yeah. of you know candle or something. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I did that for a long time, and I used to um, do kind of singer songwriter type things before I became an adult and then um, refused to sing anymore. Uh, no. uh, <laughs> you know it happens <laughs> um and then yeah I guess when I was about 15 I started writing more kind of instrumental music inspired by um tv shows and films and that's when I really started hitting it hard and I was always a massive planner and I think from the age of 15 I kind of decided I want to be a composer for film and TV and I'm going to go and do a master's in it because that's kind of the only way I know how to get training. And um, so, yeah, I found, I did all of this uh, post-grad research as a 15 year old and just kind of put myself on that path. 
and this that was research as a 15 year old wow yeah pretty much it was just like <laughs> okay this is where i'm gonna go and this is all the stuff i need to do and um yeah i was i was very serious and uh practical um which kind of did well for me because you know i i did follow that path and it was something that I, um, it's been a very important part of my life actually doing that. So it worked out. Yeah. Well, well done. Well done, young you, for planning so well. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, where, where was it you did your, your master's, by the way? Was it, it wasn't Bristol, was it? No. So, yeah, that's, that's a funny thing. So, 15 year old me was. I will go to Bristol and that's actually why I ended up doing my undergrad there because I, ah, I always why, yeah. thought I'll do the masters. Yeah. But then I, I just decided actually, I really wanted to change a scene. Um, so I went abroad and went to New York university to do it. Um, and that's why I'm sort of based there and here and kind of do, do a bit um, of cross border work, I suppose. Wow. Um, yeah. That's exciting. It's also it's it's a, also it sounds so cool, doesn't it? To be like, well, you know, yeah. do a little bit of work in London, a little bit of work in New York. I know. You know? <laughs> it's very not cool, but it does sound cool. <laughs> no. Isn't isn't the creative world filled with those type of things? You know, it's like I remember when I first started out, and I'd go onto composers' websites, and they'd say award-winning mm. composer, and I'd be like, yeah, that sounds so cool. Definitely, they must be the best <laughs> composers ever. Now I can put that up, and yeah. as my type, multi-award-winning composer. Meh. <laughs> you know, it's 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 no bit. Oh it, no, come on! It still sounds very cool, though. <laughs> it's, yeah, but it doesn't feel as cool. It's like uh, I was I was having a chat with uh, Ben Preston, who mm. he he writes under lots of aliases, uh, yeah. and his aliases rack up like hundreds of millions of streams. Wow, you know, a lot of streams. Yeah, and because it's like, well, that's what I do. You know, yeah, it sounds cool. It's like. You get used to these things, don't you? Yeah. Is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I um I went to a wedding actually at the weekend. I, I think I mentioned it and it, it was the first time that I had been out of the house in a very long time uh because of COVID. And um I always find it quite weird actually telling people what you do for a living because it's sort of it's hard to to portray it not as a hobby if you know what I mean because you know obviously it is it's a it's a life and it's something that we've you know worked so hard for but that um imposter syndrome definitely kicks in and you start really downgrading everything and you're just like well yeah it's just it's so much fun so it's not really like work um and we're always so unfair on ourselves yeah I'm so glad you brought that up because Mm. that is definitely something that happens uh because Mm -hmm. i I mean i don't know about you but uh although my mum was very supportive of Mm. a creative career i think it flies in the faces of lots of people if you manage to make a living from being creative yeah everyone's always just like you don't really work do you yeah exactly (laughs) no i actually work really hard it's just super fun (laughs) yeah (laughs) just enjoy myself I completely agree. And I think because, you know, very often we'll work from home as well. We'll have our studios in another room of the house or something. And that, again, sort of makes it feel like it's not quite a real job. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, what is, you know? Yeah. Um, it's very valuable. And I, I do think sometimes along the way I've, I've had so many doubts and thought, well, why am I doing this? You know, it's such a silly thing to be writing music for films, but, but it's part of our culture, isn't it? It's the modern day storytelling that is so important to, you know, our history as a, as a race. And um, as soon as we take the music out, you know, we realize how important it is. Um, I think we need to be kinder to ourselves as professionals. Yeah. I think it, I completely agree. It's, it's that there's a level of cultural enrichment that we are. I know it sounds great when you say it like that. Oh, we yeah. are enriching <laughs> the culture around yes. us. But the thing is, a lot of people don't fully un- understand or appreciate the jobs that yeah. composers and producers, uh, in fact, music makers of many kinds do. They don't often understand it. 
But if you're going to approach it like, okay, say all your favorite shows on Netflix, take the music out, mm. then watch those shows, you know. Absolutely. The, our, our, what we do is in everybody's homes. Mm. Yeah, all the time. Yeah, yeah. But we are, agree more. <laughs> but we're, we're fighting. Uh, well, for mm. me, I'm fighting all of those voices that are trapped in my head that have ever mm-hmm. told me music is not a real job. Mm. Uh, and, you know, it, stop kidding yourself. You're never going to make a living from it, you know. Uh, yeah. And I don't want to get to that bitter point of like, ha ha, I told you so. But yeah. Yeah. because I have, you know, we all do. We carry those negative voices with us constantly. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I mean, I kind of think the only thing that you can do is use that as a force to, you know, power you on and prove them wrong, I suppose. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think as musicians, we are always striving to get better, you know, be better musicians. And I think that's all you can do. You just always want to be a better, better composer than you were the day before. And um, those voices, I think, should just be used as fuel to just to keep going, really. To burn to, to, burn, to f- propel us forward. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Well, it, you know, I don't know about you, but that, that was definitely the case for me. You know, mm-hmm. sort of angry teenage me was like, I'll mm. show those people, <laughs> yes. you know. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> but the, it, you raise an interesting point because actually one of the things that I think is one of the most, I think almost maybe the most important skill any creative person can have mm. is not talent. It's not ability, it's perseverance. Mm. Is that a skill? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Soft skill. I, yeah. I think it is a skill yeah. because, I mean, how many times you know, has, and I, I guess this is a bit rhetorical, but how many times have you or, or I, you know, how many times have we wanted to give up? <laughs> right? So many yeah. times, I'm sure. You know, there are so many times when a project is maybe not quite going the way you thought it would or there's a little bit of a lull in work or, or even in the situation and I, that you mentioned earlier, and I do this as well, where you overwork you overcram your timetable and then I think you start spiraling and start thinking like this is just not going to work out because I've taken on too much um but yeah so I think perseverance is a skill because you need to learn to develop that thick skin um and just be sure of yourself and your craft really yeah uh that thick skin took me many many years to develop mm. uh, oh yeah i'm still developing it yeah, <laughs> yeah that's I true that's true yeah. yeah 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 because it's it's like you get it's i think it's kind of like exercise you know how you can like exercise so maybe you go running you go running yeah. and thinking i'm super fit i can run for ages now and then someone puts you in a swimming pool and after one length you're mm. I'm, I'm done this is you're too out. Yeah. yeah it's like you get used to one type of negativity you go yeah, yeah i've got a thick skin to this like you say be it uh criticism from uh, people you're working with mm-hmm. not negative like but actually uh, critical feedback more yeah more. yeah that takes skill to you know not yeah definitely. be upset by that yeah uh, not take it personally because it never is no no but it's very difficult not to take it personally yeah. <laughs> yeah. definitely yeah. yeah no i feel you <laughs> uh no the this is great that we're, we're sort of talking about this stuff. I think it's so important to highlight because especially nowadays where with the, I, I, I'm going to say it, the toxicity of social media. Yeah. Uh, agreed. Where, where we all basically see each other succeeding. Mm-hmm. <laughs> where it's like, yeah. Oh, placement, Oh, movie up oh, short yeah. film up oh, this. We're exactly. all just showing off, but none of us are kind of taking photos of those days where we're just like, I don't want to write music ever again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, Definitely. And, it, and they do come. Yeah. Days. Yeah, and I mean, I, I completely agree. Social media is toxic. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's very difficult for us now to find that balance because it's such a useful business tool. Yeah, it you know, it, it, you can't really get away from it. Um, but it is toxic. Mm. Um, but I think, you know, some, somebody said to me um, or kind of, probably posted about it actually fairly recently you know the thing you need to remember is one person's success 
isn't your downfall. You know, just yeah. because somebody else is doing really well doesn't mean that you're either also not doing really well, but with your own thing, or that it's about to happen, you know, and you've just got to keep working hard and keep doing what you love to do. I think that's again raises a very valuable point and something that puts mm. so much fear in me as a child not as a child mm. not like an eight-year-old but like yeah. 15 16 year old yeah. I can't remember, there was a tv show on i guess it was tv um <laughs> about a band oh right and at that time i wanted to be in a band i was going uh-huh. i'm going to be in a band i'm going to basically be the next smashing pumpkins yeah. and it's going to be amazing uh and the show basically showed how this mm. band full of talent, full of great songs were basically done over. Ah, right. And, and th- as the show went on, there was like a little number at the top, right? Which showed how much money the musicians have made. And by the end oh. of it, it was like minus this, 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 oh, because God. of all the, it was <laughs> yeah. like for someone wanting to be in a band, it was like the, the most fear inducing moment for me. Cause I thought, Oh wait, yeah. is this not possible? And yeah. so many people, I think especially British people carry this kind of scarcity about music mm. you know yeah. it's, it's too late to get into this now there's there's not enough work to go around it's just it's just Definitely. utter rubbish yeah <laughs> it's yeah like... I completely agree and I, I think you're right as well actually about that British mentality mm. you know we're very proper um and I think you know being a a British person living in um America as I was it, it was very interesting seeing with the difference in mentalities and the different approaches to a career like this um i think british people are very hard on, on themselves oh uh, yeah um and it's each kind other. of a yeah yeah definitely it's you know stiff up a lip and it's almost like that kind of what war mentality that we still have where you know everything's going to be okay and you just keep it inside and Mm -hmm. um it's not massively healthy i would say no no certainly not (laughs) Mm, yeah (laughs) Uh, i think i think i've i've always tried my best to rally against negativity i think and Mm. usually when i'm talking in public or talking to myself through Mm -hmm. a camera or Mm. to the microphone i'm usually trying to kind of be very almost overtly positive because yeah negativity does nothing for us yeah the positivity is what's going to do that thing you said which is also propel us forward yeah Uh, completely but but before we kind of go into sort of the world of positivity i want to i want to ask you when (laughs) (laughs) you've been dreading this one uh (laughs) when you have been at your lowest emotionally throughout Mm -hmm. you know Mm. I would say during the beginning of the pandemic. So this time last year, roughly, and I'm sure pretty much everyone can relate and say the same. Um, I think for us also, because it happened so quickly and, you know, I just remember I was in New York at the time. I point behind me as if New York is, (laughs) behind me or something um and I remember it was basically everything just happened within a week you know and schools and universities started to close in New York and um then there was the whole rush on toilet paper which I still don't (laughs) understand I don't know why everyone thought that that would just completely disappear um but yeah, I, th- I think for freelancers and for musicians, it was definitely a panic moment because there was so much uncertainty, um, especially as composers for media. We, you know, we rely on other people giving us work. So when productions stopped and, you know, we all sort of thought, well, it'll be a month. We'll go inside for a month and then you know, we'll, we'll come out and it'll, it'll all be over by summer. But then it was, you know, another month and another month. And I think, yeah, I was very worried at that point. Um, so many people were saying different things. Work was just kind of going crazy. And actually I got very lucky because I was working, um, 
already working in post on a couple of projects. And whilst a few things did get uh, rescheduled, and actually I was supposed to be scoring a feature, but it was uh, pushed back to 2023. No. Which kind of sounded a bit like, (laughs) oh, wow. (laughs) That's three years. Imagine 2023, yeah. Yeah. Um, But we, or I I personally got very lucky though because some of my... um, projects did get um, filmed just in time before things shut down and um, just kind of got in there in the nick of time. But what I thought was so uplifting about the whole situation is the music community really pulled together. Um, And I I don't know if you uh, tuned into these, but, you know, composers like Michael Price started the uh, composer coffee break. Did you see those? No, I think, did you post about that once? I think I might have said. Oh, I potentially did, yeah. Oh, yeah, because at the beginning. Big screenshot of like recently. tons of faces. Yeah, yeah, yes. I potentially did. So I only heard of it because of you. Yeah. So. Oh, right. oh, okay. Well, good. <laughs> <laughs> um, check it out, though, because they're still online and they're still, you know, timeless, fantastic conversations. And basically, he got in uh, two or three composers and had a conversation with them once a week. And he did that for, I think, about three months. And it was basically just to keep us going and to, you know, get that community feeling and the continuity, which I think everyone was really missing and craving. Um, You know, and other composers banded together and there were benefits and people started these data basis pooling all of our information so that we could really hit the remote work hard um I just I thought that was really amazing you know it was like a crisis situation and within a week two weeks or something I think it just took a few people to say right this is what we're going to do everything's going to be fine we're going to pull together and we're going to get through it together um it was just Great. It was so uplifting to see. This, this was largely the scoring community, wasn't it? It was, yeah. I saw a few uh, sort of Broadway things happening as well. I th- there was a kind of Hollywood benefit or something online um, at the beginning. So, yeah, and actually, yeah, it was the scoring world. So I don't know what it was like with um, the trailer community. I, I would personally kind of consider it as part of the scoring community. Oh, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I don't uh, know if you'd feel different. <laughs> uh, yeah, my, my experience of last year's lockdown mm. was different to that. Uh, really? Uh, I loved it. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> I loved <Great>. it. Because, <laughs> uh, do you know what? I, I've, I've got so much work in yeah. the catalogues that the big shift was that all the features Mm. kind of got pushed, but the streaming services didn't. The streaming services still had output and they all needed trailers. Often the tone of it changed. So a lot Mm. of my, uh, you know, most of my work is sort of dark thriller horror stuff. So that Mm. all kind of mm, dropped a little bit, but I honestly, I was incredibly blessed. I wasn't very affected by, Mm. um, either in my time or monetary. Yeah. Uh, and I loved the, I, I liked the first lockdown. Yeah. First lockdown. The I first liked. one. <laughs> because it was like everyone rallied together, like you said. Yeah. And, you know, we're all kind of, you know, it felt like an adventure with the kids at home. Well, quite, yeah. I was going to say, I mean, you've got two young kids, so it must have been. Got three. <laughs> yeah. I've got two <laughs> girls, one boy. Uh, oh, of course. Oh, yeah. And you said you had two girls. Yeah. So, yeah. Were you homeschooling them? Uh, Thankfully, my wife took most of the homeschooling. uh, Okay. But we were kind of alternating it at at the start of that. Okay. uh, Because it was hard work. That that was challenging. That was challenging. But uh, professionally, I I really enjoyed it. uh, I'm really glad. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad to hear it. Well, it was, it's nice. Also, I, Mm. I, I liked the fact that everyone else experienced what it's like to work from home. Yeah, you know what? You're so right. And I had, uh, yeah, friends saying, like, this is impossible. I can't do it. I can't, you know, regulate my day. And I was just thinking, well, you know what? I mean, a lot has changed, but 
I'm still in a room with my, yeah. you know, keyboard and computer. And yeah, I, I sort of think pretty much the only thing that changed in terms of working from home for me was that I just took all of my meetings online. Yes. Um, and actually, truthfully, I've been doing that a bit anyway, because I work with people, you know, like when I'm in America, I work with people here. So I'll Zoom them and do the meetings things online anyway um but yeah I agree I think it was quite nice for other people to sort of step into our world a little bit more yeah it's not so easy working from home is it because you have to regulate yourself and (laughs) you are one of the most uncontrollable people you know Mm -hmm. I'm I'm just waiting you I'm talking about one is oh yes (laughs) no I mean I can relate to that as well definitely (laughs) yeah so so that was the toughest time for you the the lockdown Mm. Uh, and you said that, which is kind of ironic what we're talking about with regards to social media, that actually social media was really useful then for everyone mm. being together. And that really helped yeah. you. Was there anything else you did that kept you on track, both emotionally and creatively? Mm. Well, I think for me, a big part of it was trying to still feel connected to the rest of the world. Um, so, I mean keeping in touch with friends and family is always a really big thing. You know, we should be doing that all the time anyway. You know, we shouldn't just be kind of staying in our little studio holes and forgetting that the the rest of the world exists. Um, But yeah, I think it was mainly just keeping going, reminding myself that, you know, there were things that I put in place work-wise that, you know, would see me through and I still had a lot to do. I mean, actually, and I guess partly it was because of the pandemic, everything went a bit topsy-turvy. So schedules changed and things got pushed back, but other things got pulled forward. Mm. So for a while I was doing, um, I guess, kind of like six and a half day weeks for probably maybe even something like 10 months. And I think it was something that I had to learn from because I, I kind of got into that as a coping mechanism because, you know, ordinarily I would do a, a day's work and then I would go out and see someone or, you know, I would spend time with the family or, or whatever. But yeah, I think I was almost relying on work too much so for me, then it was the second lockdown, uh, whenever that was now, um, that I sort of, I guess sort of like October, November time. Yeah, it's when we went to those strange tears. Yeah, the weird yeah. tears and was it a lockdown and then it yeah. was a lockdown. I'm, I don't I think know. it was officially January because the kids went back to school for a day. Oh, right. And then... oh, of course. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. of course. <laughs> um, yeah, and I think for me, the area I'm in was in Tiv or the um the whole time I think so it was pretty much just a lockdown you know it it was just that and um yeah then I had to work out you know you know I'm going to get some exercise in and I'm going to take breaks and um I think it was a nice chance to revisit other things that really helped me creatively like um I'm a big reader so I used to sort of take a break and maybe like catch up on a TV program or something that I'd heard was really good. And I wanted to sort of, you know, be in the know about it. But nowadays I pretty much just read all the time when I'm not working. Um, And it's still, you know, a story. I'm very much into fiction. Um, So that's inspirational and it keeps the creativity going. I think you need a bit of time away from the screen sometimes uh yes uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's uh it's it's a lot i mean we have a very screen heavy career obviously um but yeah just i just needed to i guess regulate things even more than i was before and start being really strict with myself um about the way i was handling the schedule really yeah that's that's a big one and you know, we we joked about 
other people who weren't used to working from home mm. understanding it. But if you are looking into a career as a creative professional, most mm-hmm. of well, the, the chances you will be working from home and you will need to learn yeah. how to structure your time and also be Definitely. be good with that structure because it's so easy just to be like, eh, I'll take a break in another half an hour. And then before you realize it, it's like pressing yeah. snooze on the alarm, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Before you realize it, it, you've been sat at your desk for 10 hours, basically doing nothing. Completely. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, you have to really think about, you know, your mental health, but also your physical health. Um, your back is going to be destroyed. Mm. You know, if, if you spend so much time, and I remember, um, I know, but, but straight. Sit so up straight. Come on. <laughs> um, but it's really terrible. We've, we've got to be more careful about it. And I know my, um, so I'm at home with family currently and my, uh, my brother is here who is a historian and he works, um, I mean, like less than us, but he works a lot on the computer because he's looking at archives and library databases, you know, from, from all over the world. And I just go and I see him working. He's like hunched over and, and um, I just sort of keep, you know, like slapping him and say, you need to stand up yeah. straight, sit up straight. And, but yeah, I think definitely if, you're, if you want to pursue a career in something like this, and I think as well, when creative people are a little bit unorthodox and you're not going to be doing the normal nine to five necessarily, you need to be strict with yourself and take care of yourself. And, and I, I think kind of be kind to yourself as well, rather than being, you know, really hard on yourself because you didn't do a certain task in the time frame that you thought or, you know, something like that. Yeah. you got to be realistic. Mm-hmm. Totally. I, th- I think a lot of that is to do with the fact that our sense of achievement mm. usually comes from being able to tick a box, right? Like yeah. I have done so this, whereas creative work, it's not, it's not black and white. It's, it's mm. constant grayscale. So you don't always necessarily get to tick that box. Completely. So we, so we push the envelope so that we can take a box i.e finish a queue right Mm, yeah so we're just like we're pushing and pushing and pushing to finish it well that's definitely me anyway just Mm. so i can go done yeah i realize i've done nothing but worked yeah and it's like you have the satisfaction of finishing the queue and feeling like you've accomplished something but then yeah i mean i kind of think as well you know we have one life to live and Work, you know, is, is so important. But I'm, I guess I'm trying to, to get myself to remember that you also need to do other things in your life. You know, yeah. you need to go for a walk and see what's going on outside or, you know, you need to keep up to date with the, the news or see how a neighbor's doing or, you know, whatever. You, you need to be careful that you're not just becoming so embroiled in that one project um because i think you can almost become obsessive you know and i'm totally the same i i work doggedly at a queue and it's just sort of like but do i feel com- i'm sort of exhausting myself creatively by the end of it and yeah. is that useful yeah no i i agree and also you mm. you your critical ear is weakened over time yeah you know so, I mean, I try my best to stick to the idea of writing and editing are separate tasks. So I do them at separate times. Mm. I will write. I will not edit anything. I will just mm-hmm. write, even if that means I start 10 cues. Yeah. And then I will go back and edit separately because if you're writing and editing, especially as you get more tired, you find that you edit more severely, you know, you mm, become that horrible boss that's overly critical. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, micromanage- and then you just go, just scrap the whole thing. It's rubbish. Exactly. <laughs> well, that's the thing. Yeah. You start getting so harsh on yourself that you can't hear it anymore. And you just think, you know, I'm a terrible composer. Why am I doing this? <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. it's just it's so easy to spiral. Um, yeah. I think in a way that's why, you know, I'm a big advocate of kind of connecting with the composer community, you know, 
I like sharing your work with a colleague or a composer friend or something and getting a second opinion. Um, or even just somebody saying like, yeah, that sounds pretty good. And just sort of having that imposter syndrome kind of tamped down a little bit and being yeah. like, okay, that's doing what I wanted it to and what I thought it was doing. And, yeah. yeah, it's uh, that, that little voice creeps up when you least expect it. Well, mm -hmm. pretty much constantly, but you know, yeah. that kind of idea that oh, actually what you're doing is a waste of time. You're a failure yeah. and you're not going anywhere. <laughs> Unless you get Definitely. that moment where like someone, like you say, where someone goes, great work or, oh, you've landed a placement or, oh, the, yeah. this thing you've been working on is now live, you know, then you yeah. go, oh, yeah, yeah I'm yeah. doing something. And then you wait for somebody to say, and then you, it's almost mm. like you're waiting wait for, for the praise. positive reinforcement, which yeah. is, I think, uh, not, not as healthy as it should be, but. I don't <laughs> think it's good. No, no, because as well, you know, you want to take satisfaction in, in your work and your process and be you know really pleased with something that you've you've done because at the end of the day i mean stuff with film you know if you're writing for a client obviously at the end of the day it's their call and you need them to we well, you need and want them to like it um and to approve it but i kind of think as well there's no point in pursuing this career if you're also if you're not also taking satisfaction in your own work and just, you know, every now and then thinking, huh, yeah, you know what? That's kind of cool. I like that. Yeah. Um, otherwise it's not fulfilling, is it? No. I once, uh, do, you, do you remember the band The Verve? Uh, with mm, Lee, yeah. Lee Singer, Richard Ashcroft. I remember mm -hmm. hearing an interview with him once and the interviewer was asking about his creative process and, this always stuck with me because he said, mm. oh, someone's going to, someone, I know someone's going to message me and say, that wasn't Richard Ashcroft, that was someone else. <laughs> uh, I feel like it was Richard <laughs> Ashcroft. Uh, he said, if it doesn't light you up, then what's the point? I think that's yeah. just brilliant. So true. Up, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. I'm going to, I'm so, going to keep that with me. I like that. <laughs> it's, it's a good one, isn't it? I, mm. I, it's it was also, it's, it's short enough for me to be able to remember, you know, yeah. I was like that yeah, everyone as people. Exactly, yeah. Yes. Uh, and then put Richard Ashcroft question mark next to it. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Indie singer. Um, so let's talk about you now, O'Reilly. Uh, you know, mm. I, I love hearing about what people are doing now, not necessarily work, but what they're doing in mm. their day, you know. So nice question. When are you most productive during the day? You know what? I think that changes day to day. Oh. Nice. Yeah, which is a little difficult, I would say, because you can't kind of plan ahead, but um, probably afternoon, at least. Um, I'm really not a morning person, so I kind of use the morning, or at least the early morning to do things like, um, you know, exercise and kind of wake up for the day and get your brain working. Um, and uh, And as I said before, you know, I read like, a couple of chapters of, of a book or um i've gotten really into crosswords lately so that's kind of a nice standard nice or cryptic oh god the very easy ones <laughs> yeah. yeah i like arrow words because they're even easier <laughs> yes, they're good i mean i i can't do the cryptic ones i um my mother is a puzzle fiend and she actually she said oh let's let's do a cryptic one when i said that i was getting into them I don't even understand what the questions are asking me. You know, no. I, I can't do it. But the, the very basic, the general knowledge ones, which mm -hmm. make me feel like I know things about yeah. the world, you know. Yeah. Um, so I'll do something like that. And then um, I quite like having meetings early on in the day because um, that kind of spurs me on. I find that so inspiring, kind of vibing off somebody else's energy and... Um, I really love the people that I work with. And at, at the moment I'm working with um, a few really great people, uh, one on a short film and one on a podcast series. Nice. Um, and we just kind of chat for a while. And afterwards I feel so energized and positive and, and just feeling like, yeah, this project is going to be so great. And, you know, then I'll, I'll start all of the, the composition work after that. Um, I think it's important to take breaks as well in the day. Um, 
and I'm trying to do that more. I'm trying to do, I guess, sort of more like nuggets or sections of work and then take a bit of a break and then come back to it. Um, Because I think actually I've realized that some of my best work is usually after I've taken a break and then I'll do kind of a few minutes of improvisation and then I just think, oh, that's the theme now. Um, I think just switching off your brain and then going back into it and doing that very natural improvisation. Um, I, mean, I don't know how you, how you work, but I've got a, a keyboard and I'm a, uh, I am a pianist. So I do kind of like no- noodling around a bit. Um, I find that a very um, productive part of the day, actually. And this is usually the afternoon, you say? Yeah, usually the afternoon. Yeah. And then I'll work. And I mean, again, it depends on uh, projects or, you know, the current schedule or time zones as well. Uh, that's always a bit of a, a bit of a struggle. Um, but yeah, I'll usually kind of work till the evening time. Um, and then I'll either start reading again or I'll check in with um, a webinar or something like that, because there are so many of those going on at the moment. Um, Any particulars you could recommend? Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, I, I don't know if you would have even thought about this, but you should definitely join as a, a um, an ally, um, or maybe you already <laughs> have. Um, but the Alliance for Women Film Composers, um, they have just got so many fantastic got a events. Ton going on, haven't they? Yeah, yeah they're so brilliant. Um, they have screenings and. Um, I think they've started having listening parties, maybe. I'm not quite sure, but they um, they have so many things going on for every composer at every stage of their career. You know, it's they have skill sessions and conversations with people about their work or their process. Um, so that, that's been really great. And they have, I mean, obviously it's a global thing, um, but the UK, Europe, base is so active and they they've just got so much going on um mm. i absolutely love what they're doing yeah uh, not just as as content but mm. uh, i always thought it was so weird how you know studying music mm-hmm. it was usually equal boys and girls you know, yes. start, you know, yeah. it, through university, studying music. Okay, maybe mm-hmm. sort of when you get to music tech, it was less girls, but studying mm. music, men and women, great. Yeah. And then you leave university and then all of a sudden you go, oh, who's scoring all these films? I know. Oh, it's all yeah. dudes. Like, yeah. What was it? It was uh, all you, the, only other, the only women you ever saw was Debbie Wiseman and Rachel. Yeah, and Rachel Portman. Rachel Portman, yeah. yeah. It, was, it was like, where, where did all the ladies go? You know, I, I just know. Thought, it's really terrible. And I mean, I think the, when was it? I guess it was the Oscars last year. Oh, yes. When Hilda Goodnadotter um, won Best Original Score. And I thought it was so telling because in so many interviews, she had to explain to people, um, no, she's not. It, it was something like people were claiming that she was the first woman to win. <laughs> and she was saying like, no, 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 I'm not. You know, Rachel Portman and Debbie Wiseman um, won in, I think it was 94 and 95. Um, and some, somebody else did win. I think she was the fourth woman. Mm-hmm. But the Which is awful. That, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. The fact that it was such a novelty. Yeah. And also the women that had won before were such a long time ago that apparently it's just fallen out of the public consciousness. So people just thought Hilda must be the first one. It hasn't yeah. happened in so long. And yeah, it's really awful. And I think what's so great about the Alliance is that their whole mission is to eventually become obsolete, you know? Yeah. So it's not, where it's not an actual thing. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. We don't need that additional support and advocacy. Yeah. Um, but also there are so many men in there as well which is exactly how it should be. You know, we should all be supporting each other. We should all be supporting women and minorities. It shouldn't just be, you know, women supporting women. It's a fight for all of us because all of us want 
equality. You know, we don't want female domination. That's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's what's so good about them. They, you know, they, they were founded by a couple of men as well. And it's um, the, the two guys at White Bear PR. I'm not sure mm -hmm. if you, you know them, but they're, um, they're very, very, a very key part of it. Um, and actually, they're the ones that got me involved with it in the first place. Because I had never heard of it until maybe three, four years ago. And I met them at uh, an NYU talk. They came in and I just was talking about, um, you know, was there anything going on in, in Europe that, that they knew about? And they said, well, go along to this thing in the UK. And um, that's how I found them. And that, that has been a massive, massive part of my career, actually just kind of joining that group and um, getting to know the composers in that uh, organization. Yeah. But yeah, check, check it out for anyone listening because they've got some amazing resources. Yeah. Their Instagram feed is, is pretty hot right now, you know, as, yes. in, as in they're just, they're posting such relevant stuff and mm -hmm. they're constantly doing talks and it's just yeah. awesome. Like, yeah. Uh, and they're very good with their hashtags as well. They are, yes. <laughs> Easy to find. <laughs> yes, they are. And I, I'm really glad that they've, because Instagram is fairly recent for them, but they've been on um, Facebook for ages. But I, I don't know if you've found this, but I think Instagram is much more popular right now. You know, I think yeah. it's easier to find people. Um, There's far less toxicity. Find, yes, I think so. It is nicer. Um, mm -hmm. Twitter is, ooh, dare I say evil? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't but, have, I don't have a Twitter account, thankfully. I have a Facebook account, uh, but I try well my done. absolute best mm. not to go on it. because Also, mm. because I run ads to things, people say mean mm, things. Yeah. And I, don't, I, you know, I have, a, I, I have I an know. internal voice saying those mean things anyway. So yeah. having someone yeah, else... Yeah, you don't need it again. <laughs> You know, I've yeah. even had some incredibly famous people uh, saying not very nice things. Um, really? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and which it's I think shocking. is kind of is kind of representative of that culture, which yeah. is I've got a platform and I will use it to basically mm -hmm. get my own anger at the world on somebody else. Definitely. And I, I like Instagram for that. That I, yep. you don't have to deal with that. It's all just like no. much nicer. Yeah, and I mean, I guess the problem with social media is that people feel like there's a barrier and they are not being held accountable for things they're saying. Yes. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's so shameful. Mm. I kind of think things have gotten worse as well in the last year, I, I guess because people are inside, really. Yeah, everyone's um, a lot unhappier with themselves. Yeah, they're, they're going stir crazy and... Um, yeah, I mean, I just think we need to be, I've said it a thousand times today, but kinder to ourselves and kinder to other people. It's, yeah. um, it's, not, it's not practical, you know, it's not, it's not useful to anyone doing that. What's, no. what's the use? Yeah, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything exactly. at all. Exactly, just stay quiet, <laughs> pipe down. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, yes, uh, Twitter and Facebook. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, Whew. Um, I'm glad, like I said, uh, or, you know, I, I think it's a struggle, you know, like you say, screen time anyway, you know, because obviously yeah. we work on a screen and I, and I kind of try my be best not to have any other things open other than logic, which is what I use. Yeah. Uh, mm. But then you turn your computer off and go, oh, hello, mobile phone. <laughs> it's terrible, isn't it? Yeah. And then you're back on your screen. Yeah. You know what? Have you ever been to those restaurants where they have a little... Um box painted on the table and you're supposed to put your mobile phone in it and you're the, the, the kind of theory is that you all put your phone in the little box on the table and then no one looks at the phone for the duration of the meal I think we all need that in our studios we need a little okay. place just to 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 get away from it and actually I've I have gone into the habit of leaving it in another room or leaving it upstairs or downstairs so I sort of I don't have that compulsion to look because it no. is just a feeling. You you don't ever really need to be looking at your phone. You know, no. you you can just cut yourself off from it. Mm -hmm. 
I think it, it, it's difficult because as a freelancer, it plays on your insecurities, especially when you're trying to make connections. Uh, yeah. You know, and if you reach out for somebody, there's that little insecure part of you going, have they replied yet? You know? Yes. Uh, just, just check, just check yeah. if they've replied because you want every, everything is immediate or can be immediate. So you expect mm-hmm. it to. And if it's not immediate, if their response or whatever, you know, people liking your post is not immediate. Yeah. That voice goes, well, you're a failure. You should just yes. give up. <laughs> yeah. Like, why haven't they gotten back to me yet? What's wrong? What did yeah. I say that was wrong? You know? I know. It's, it's, uh, it's ridiculous, isn't it? But so easy to fall into that trap. Mm-hmm. Oh, I, I'd fight on, I fight that daily, mm. even though I completely, I'm, I'm aware of myself and mm. I'm aware that this feeling is, is coming from a, a negative place mm. and I'm aware that checking is not going to help. But go on then, I'll just have it. a quick, yeah. <laughs> last time, <laughs> go away phone. <laughs> yeah, I do it as well. It's so bad. And I mean, you know, I can, I see that you've got it there. I've got my phone like right next to me. Just in case. Yeah, no. <laughs> Why? Why would I need it? I'm already on my computer, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. Uh, it's so silly. I mean, I guess it's just um, the 21st century existence. Yes, it is. Uh, and it's just another test for us all. Yes, definitely. So you've, you, you've kind of, you've hammered through your day, which is beautiful. Mm. You've, kind of, you've basically kind of told me exactly what your day is. Cause yeah, I was going to be like, what are your afternoons like? What are your evenings like? But you've done that. Yeah. Tick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tick. And you've kind of said you use reading a lot as, as mm. your kind of like wind down, which I think is wonderful. And I, I endeavor to read more because when I'm on holiday, mm. I read and I feel yeah. relaxed when I get home. Uh, there's my squirrel brain is going. Completely. So I, I admire the fact that you've, sit down and read because reading is awesome it's Uh, something that I've had to learn how to do though as well because I always did it as a kid and then as soon as I went to university just got you know I got out of the habit but it was when I was going through a period at university where it was I guess sort of like crisis mode and I rediscovered reading and it just it helped so much it it always helps with my mental health with my creativity um, just having something on the go and being able to escape into something else, I think is really, really valuable. Totally. Mm. Um, now this, this is just an off the bat question. Mm-hmm. Cause I'm just curious, yes. how did you start getting work in the realm of composing? Mm. I found, and still do actually most of my work online um so i got my what through your yeah. website or social media or forums no, or no i didn't like... have a website for a long time so i i found a, a website it was kind of a networking website and it was when i was living in bristol what was it called um, it was called kahootify <laughs> which is a great name <laughs> um and it's i'm not sure if it still is but at the time it was aimed towards the, the west country basically And um, I was super lucky. I connected with this guy who I'm still very much in touch with. So um, when was that? I mean, that was, that that was several years ago, but I, I met this Portuguese filmmaker who was studying in Western Supermare and I scored his first film and it was the first film that I'd ever I've scored and it, it was such a, you know, learning curve, great experience. But after that, we stayed in touch and actually just for various reasons, not many of our projects kind of got finished. I, th- I think just because of, um, we, we both moved city. Um, well, in fact, we both moved country um, and then he had a baby and it was, you know, life got in the way, but we, we always stayed in touch. And then after that, it was a matter of building up my portfolio and just kind of connecting with anybody that I could online. Um, nowadays, the work I get is either from people approaching me via Instagram, which always shocks me. I never thought that would happen. 
Um, and I'm always delighted when anybody reaches out. Um, and also it's another imposter syndrome thing where somebody reaches out and says, I've listened to your music. I'd love you to score my film. And I think, really? Yeah. <laughs> if you're sure. <laughs> um, so either that will happen or um, I hit the Facebook forums really hard. Um, so, yeah, I just do a lot of online networking. Um, although I say networking, I prefer to think of it as, as just making friends, basically, because I think that's what networking is. You're just chatting with other people who like the same Have thing. common interests. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And... Um, yeah, a, a few times I have met people um, in person. But of course, I haven't been to an in-person networking event in a little while um, because, of, because of COVID. But yeah, online has just been a massive help. Um, but that also includes um, profiles I have. So people find me on the Alliance for Women Film Composers um, database. Um, sometimes through my website, but I, I think mostly it's social media at this point. Um, Isn't that amazing? It's there fascinating. It's That's why strange. it's still <laughs> such a useful tool. It's just yeah. tool you have to learn to use yeah. correctly. Completely. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I have, I have overlooked social media as a, as a work tool mm. so much because I've strived to avoid it at all costs because I know it has a terrible effect on my mood. Yeah. Uh, even if I uh, accept until uh, one of my students from uh, the trailer music school, mm. Andrew Skipper, he suggested to me, you know, he found it, he would just go down a wormhole of negativity if he went on Facebook yeah. or whatever it was. He said, until I started actively commenting on everything, he said, just interesting. Take 10 to 20 seconds and put a nice comment relating to what someone's posted on everything. That's nice. And it's, and it works so well because yeah. also it, it makes you realize how much stuff you're seeing. Mm. And, and also it's kind of like doing service for other people. Yeah. Where you go, I'm going to say something nice to you. Mm. I don't expect anything back, but you know, well done mm. you for putting this out to the world. Cause yeah. that is a hard thing to do. Definitely. Uh, so yeah I, I yeah, I try and practice that, but I still sometimes mindlessly go, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes, just scroll. I like that idea though. I, I might try, try doing that because I got, I got into a bit of a phase actually of, you know, a lot of people were posting things. They had all of these new releases and I, I would comment on them or share, share them. But I guess I go through sort of peaks and troughs with social media and, and sort of get really into it and think, oh, can't do yes. it for a while, you know, and, um, mm -hmm. but yeah, it's just, it's, it is just that it's a business tool. Um, and actually so many people have said either in PR or other composers, I don't think you can really get into the business now without social media. Yeah. And I'm sure there are exemptions definitely, but, um, it is useful. Mm-hmm. I think it's amazing that you get so much work through it. I, I'm amazed, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> I no, don't it's know great. how it happens. <laughs> well, well, this is the thing, you know, if, uh, mm. that's why I asked, because I'm, I'm always curious as to how people got into their industry. And often yeah. it's like someone I knew. Uh, mm. uh, but, you know, obviously that connection is interesting how that came about. But, mm. you know, how you get work. The fact yeah. that you're getting work still to this day through things like Instagram and those uh, mm. databases is fantastic. So... It's very interesting, yeah, yeah. Now, speaking of those people coming into the creative life, mm. uh, I'm always keen to hear advice. Now, what would your advice be to someone who is struggling in their creative journey? Mm. I would honestly keep it simple and just keep going. Um which sounds like nothing, but I think you, I think that's all you need to do. Um, remind yourself why you wanted to get into it in the first place. Um, take, 
pleasure in the work you're doing and take pride in it as well. Um, and I would just say continue to better yourself, hone your craft, learn more, connect more, um, listen more. I think just is kind of the advice that I would give to anybody and also myself at any point in your career, whether you're struggling or having a really great time of it, you can always get better. Keep educating yourself and better, you know, bettering yourself, enriching yourself. And um, yeah, just keep going. It'll be all right. <laughs> nice. Mm. It, you're right. It's simple, but often... Yeah. The best advice is the simplest advice we mm -hmm. often hear a lot. Yeah. So, Aureli, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been an absolute thank pleasure. Uh, I hope the audience get as much out of this conversation as I did. It was awesome hearing about your career, your ups and your downs. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. It's been absolutely brilliant. <laughs>